with the song. Um, when you read the Bible, uh, specifically when it speaks about heaven, um, it doesn't give you much. It gives you a little bit. It gives you glimpses. Um, it speaks about certain things that we can uh, ex expect. But the Lord intentionally leaves that as a mystery for us. Um, and he gives us just enough of what we need to know. Uh, but the portion of the Bible where you actually see the most about the new heaven and the new earth is what we're going to be exploring today. Uh, we're not going to go no more than about 13, 14 scriptures. Uh, we're going to we're going to stop there. And a lot of what you see here doesn't have um, teachings about morality or getting closer to the Lord. It's specifically given us and in, not instructions, but given us a, a overview of what John um, the apostle saw when he was able to see the vision um, uh, to explain to us of what we can expect when it comes to the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, there will be some things that we can see that we can evaluate ourselves pertaining to, but most of it is just God giving us information, right? Um, just so that our imagination can begin to click and we can just think about those things that he has in store for us. So let's go ahead and get into our lesson. Let me find you. Bam. After the millennium. All right. So we have looked at a lot of things. We have seen how, um, you know, we were beginning to look at the differences between um, <clears throat> the millennial kingdom and the kingdom that translates into eternity, right? And we're done looking at the millennial kingdom at this point in time. Now our focus is more so on the kingdom that comes after that. Now it is again, the same kingdom but there are significant differences between the millennial kingdom and uh, the kingdom that is to come, that transitions, that's the eternal kingdom of Christ. One of the things we stated is that um, there will be no more death. When Christ comes to the earth in the millennial kingdom, you will have uh, a few groups of people. You will have angels who will be present on the earth. Uh, you will have mortal men like you and I are right now. Um, then you have immortal men who will never see death again. That's you and I in the future, right? We'll have Jesus Christ who will be here as well physically on the earth and we can visit him. Uh, his residence will be high on the mountain um, above all the earth. And uh, New Jerusalem will be the city that he will be uh, living and having his uh, throne established on. And men will be coming in and out constantly to hear the wisdom of Jesus Christ uh, day after day. His gates will always be open and men can always come and visit. Um, but again, there are still some things that will be present on the earth, such as uh, the desire for men to sin in their hearts. That doesn't go away. Uh, the curse of sin is still here, uh, not as active as it once was, but it will still be here because, again, men will still die. But the Lord removes a lot of that um, when it comes to it. The nature of animals changes. They're going to be attacking one another or us anymore. Um, there will no longer be any deserts anymore because the Lord has made the entire earth blossom and become beautiful uh, in a way that words can't describe, right? After that, we know that uh, the kingdom, not just the kingdom, the entire world is burned up and the universe and the stars and the clouds, all of that takes place. And then we come into Revelation chapter 21. And in Revelation chapter 21, that's when we begin to see what takes place after the millennium, after the final judgment is over, after sin is completely done away with. That's when we go back into uh, what we're looking at today. We look at a world where sin does not exist. The concept of sin does not exist in any way, shape, form, or fashion. There is nothing bad or ill or evil that will ever enter into this new world and this new heaven. There will never be a negative thought, negative connotation. There'll never be any criticism. Nobody will ever hate upon you. There will be no decay. There will be no death. There will be no ill feelings, no hospitals, no nurses, anything that's bad right? Nurses aren't bad, but we need nurses because of bad things that happen in the body. But anything that's bad that takes place or that's created a job to uh, James being security, we won't need security. We won't need any of those things whatsoever when it comes to the new heaven and the new earth. And so as we go back and we look at verse one in Revelation chapter 21, it says, then I, this is John, 
the disciples speak it. Not John the Baptist, like it was on the questionnaire, but John the apostle, the one of the 12 disciples that walk with Jesus as an old man now on the island of Patmos, right? He's been exiled uh, and he sees his vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more, okay? Then we skip down to verse two. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband, right? And this is a metaphor of how beautiful the city was, right? I mean, it, when it comes to wedding time, I've never seen a bride that hadn't been done up and beautiful, right? Um, and so in like manner, as a bride prepares to meet her husband to take those vows before the Lord God, so will the uh, city, the new city, the new Jerusalem be prepared as it comes down from heaven so that we can witness it and see it for ourselves, okay? Revelation 21 and 3, then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. And so like we saw in the millennial kingdom, uh, it will be Jesus himself who will sit on the throne here on the earth. But when the new heaven and the new earth comes, the holy city where God the father and the son currently are right now, descends from that particular place and comes down to where we are. And God the Father will now be with us just as God the Son was with us. And his dwelling place will always be with us forever, right? And we can finally look upon his face and see him and know him as he is, okay? Currently, we can't right now because we're separated because of sin, but again, this is a place where sin will be done away with. It will no longer exist in our members or in our mind. And now we'll no longer be separated from God. Okay. And so as we move forward, <clears throat> um, we'll be looking. Um, see, we talked about this last time. And so we are going to skip past that. Hey, Madison, do me a favor, okay? You with me? Mm -hmm. Do me a favor and remind me when, when we get finished, Kiwi got to take the same test because she just logged on, okay? <sighs> <laughs> we can't let her get away with it. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> Revelation 21 and 4. Um, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Again, like I said before, God gets rid of all of that stuff. And I don't know how God will do it, right? Because I know that we will have memory of a lot of things, but at the same time, I don't know how God himself will develop us or do something. He does something in us in such a way where even if we are able to remember certain things that took place, it we won't be affected by it anymore. Right. Uh, it's one of the most incredible things that God can do. And God, we know, can do anything. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making all things new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. I remember one of Jesus greatest pleasures is to share all that he has with us, right? And he didn't want this to be a secret. He wanted John to write it so that each generation of Christians from whatever era, you know, exists from the moment that Christ left until we are now all the way up until he comes back. He wants them to have something to look forward to. He wants to share this with them so that they can have something to hold on to, right? Not only is he coming back, but he's going to restore and give us something even greater than what we can even think of or imagine. OK, um, again, right, because these words are faithful and true. You can bank on it and don't let anybody ever change your mind about anything that you are seeing right now. Jesus is saying you can depend on this no matter what you go through, no matter how tough life gets. And it will get tough and challenging. Yo, believe that I have something better for you. Revelation 21 and 6 says, then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
Okay, again, like I said last time, the alpha and the omega are actually letters in the Greek alphabet, which means the first letter is like saying, I'm the A and I'm the Z. I'm the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. Now, this I'm going to explain to you, but I want to actually kind of get you to talk to me. Okay. So, matter of fact, let's make this just a little bit bigger. Can everybody see these words? I want to make sure they're not too small for you. Okay. I'm, I'm going to take it that y'all can see it. Um, current slide. Bang. Yeah, actually. See, all right, cool, cool. In the Gospels, Jesus comes upon a certain situation and speaks about a certain type of water he could offer. What kind of water was Jesus offering? And why did he say what he said to whom he was speaking to? I'm going to give you guys a hint. John chapter 4. I'm going to read the question again. In the Gospels, Jesus comes upon a certain situation and speaks about a certain type of water he could offer. What kind of water was Jesus offering? And why did he say what he said to whom he was speaking to? I was give you... it... Go ahead. Was it at the well? What about the well? Tell me about it. I'm listening. I don't want to say it completely wrong, but the woman, the, the woman at the well that had all the husbands. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and he, he wanted to, uh, the what was it of life? It was a water of, uh, I can't, I can't, I don't have it completely, but I know it's, it's her at the well. I, that's all I got. <laughs> all right. But you know but what? You are eternal right life is what he was trying to offer her though. It was more than uh -huh. just to quench her thirst. Uh -huh. Come on. You've been reading your Bible, huh? <laughs> Maybe just a little. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. You have it totally correct. Uh, in John chapter four, Jesus and his disciples off to go and get something to eat. And when he did that, he actually already had an appointed time, but he was supposed to meet this Samaritan woman. Um, and this Samaritan woman was at the well getting some water, drawing some water. And when she was, Jesus went to her and said, hey, give me a drink. And she was like, huh? Right. She said, I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew and you asking me for some water. Right. If you know anything. Uh, the Samaritans and the Jews had beef for hundreds of years. They did not like each other. They did not mingle with each other. Compare it to how black people and white people during the civil rights time didn't get along at all, right? That's what they beef was like, <laughs> okay? And so when Jesus approached her, it blew her mind that, she would, that he would even speak to her because she was a Samaritan. But when she said that, Jesus said... Uh, <laughs> I have water here. Like if you really knew who it was that was speaking to you and what I was offering, then you would ask me, right? And he was speaking about giving her the water of life, okay? Um, and that's incredible because um, he basically told her, in the words, just like Ashley said, um, look, <laughs> you can drink from this. And once you drink from this, you're going to be thirsty again. But the water that I give, you will never thirst for anything ever again. And it's mind-boggling when you think about that. And so that same type of water Jesus is speaking of here, okay? Um, I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. Living water is what Jesus told her, okay? And that's what he was talking about. Now, when he speaks about the living water, believe it or not, he's not talking about actual water, Okay. He's not talking about something that could quench your thirst. He was speaking about the Holy Spirit and giving it to her, right? And from that particular thing, <laughs> there are so many things that spring forth from it. Um, Christ, he quenches our thirst for righteousness, right? Um, for goodness. For me. He quenches our thirst in every aspect, especially in the spiritual sense. And this is what he's speaking of. Right here again, Revelation 21 and 6. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life, right? Um, the Holy Spirit gives us new life, right? It quickens us and makes us alive. 
Uh, that word quickens is an Old Testament way, or well, not Old Testament, the King James Version. I say Old Testament because it's it's old, you know, the King James Version uh, of make, basically saying making alive. This is what Christ is saying. I'm going to give you eternal life. I'm going to give you new life. Okay. And Ashley, thank you so much. That was a wonderful answer. Okay. <clears throat> Revelation 2, 21, verses 7 and 8. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderous, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death, okay? You can be born twice and die once, or you can be born once and die twice, okay? If you go to hell, you get out of hell just to be judged and cast into the lake of fire, and Jesus calls this the second death. The word death truly just means separation, right? When you die, you're separated from the physical world here, and now you go into eternity, whether you eternally saved or eternally lost, okay? And so whenever a person gets cast into the lake of fire, the second death means that you are completely separated from God for all of eternity, okay? That is the second death. Now look at this. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying the one who conquers, okay? When you conquer something, you overcome something. You, have, you overcome some type of adversity, okay? That's what it means to conquer. The one who conquers will inherit these things, okay? And I will be his God and he will be my son. What is it that we're trying to conquer, right? So that we can, we can have this eternal life. Because when it speaks about us conquering, it's not necessarily saying that I have to work to be saved. That's not what it's saying. But look at what it's saying. The one who conquers, what are we conquering? Look at verse eight. Oh, well, matter of fact, let's just read it. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderous, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We want to conquer these things and overcome these things that are present in our lives okay there's a there's been a time when all of us have been afraid and cowardly there's been times when we've been faithless i don't think god gonna do it right we've done detestable things jesus said that if you hate without a cause you are a murderer right sexually immoral if you've ever had sex outside of marriage at any point in time in your career of life yo you sexually immoral and i don't, I don't care if you had sex at, uh with a woman or with a man Right. Either way it go, you sexually immoral if you're having any type of sex outside of marriage. Sorcerers, people who play with the occult. You go to people who are um, trying to be palm readers or you're trying to talk to the dead, things of that nature. Idolatrous. Anything that you give a higher precedence in your life than God, you become an idolater. OK, for most people it's money. All liars. <laughs> right. All of us fit into these categories. So none of us deserve to have life anew with Christ. All of us deserve, deserve to have this second death. Let's go into a little bit more detail. Okay. Make it make sense. What is a coward? A person that lacks the courage to do or endure dangerous or unpleasant things. Man, sometimes <laughs> being a Christian means that we have to endure and have to have courage to deal with dangerous and unpleasant things, people, and situations. But if you don't have the courage to do it and you back away, yo, you become a coward in that instance, right? Some of us are afraid to say that we're Christians because we're afraid of the rebuttal that comes from other people. We're afraid of them to make fun of us, right? You know, we, we're ashamed to say that, this is wrong and, and it's wrong because God says that it's wrong, right? Because we don't want to offend people, but the gospel itself is an offense, all right? You share the gospel in any way, shape, form, or fashion, it's going to offend somebody. And the reason why is because it's showing you something about yourself that you don't like. Point blank period. It's yeah. showing you that you're not right. 
with God. All right. Yeah. <laughs> And so with that being said and done, it's yeah. going to offend you and you can't be afraid to offend people because you're trying to give them something that's more important than them being offended. All right? Faithless. Untrue to what should command yeah. one's fidelity or allegiance. Let me read that again. Faithless is yeah. untrue uh -huh. to what should command one's yeah. fidelity or allegiance. Yo, we haven't always been faithful to God. Let's keep it real. We have not always been faithful to God. No. The Lord says just our speech yeah. alone, right? Are you cussing? Are you criticizing people unjustly? Right? Do you, you think you're better than other people in doing certain things? All right? Look, we can be faithless and not be faith and just not being faithful to what God has commanded, right? We don't deserve to go to heaven. Detestable. Let's go to the next slide. Proverbs 6 and 16 says, There are six yeah. things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. The King James Version says, An abomination, right? An abomination is something that causes disgust or hatred. And detestable is something that is deserving of intense dislike, right? These are the things that, that are offensive to God because they ain't right, right? And I mean, it's sins out there, but it's some sins. It's just like, bro, what are you doing? How could you do that, right? And so God himself lists those things when you look in Proverbs chapter six. And so as you look at these things, there are people who practice these things. And this is a lifestyle. This is what they love. OK, that's why we have to be careful what we see and what we do and what we give approval to, because anything that the devil can get you to laugh at, you'll never take seriously again. Right. And that's what he likes to do. He likes to make us look at things in the wrong way. And sooner or later, our level of morality kind of just dwindles and goes out the window and we begin to engage and show approval for detestable things. OK. Then we come over here to the list, the other list, murderer. We know what a murderer is. The unlawful, premeditated murder of an, another human being, taking somebody's life, right? Sexually immoral, any type of sexual activity outside of God's design for marriage, sorcery, the use of spells, divination, or speaking to spirits is clearly condemned in the Bible. Let's throw that horoscope in there, too, because y'all, you know, Aries season, this and that, yo, all of that is part of sorcery, too. Leave that alone. And then the last one, it says idolatrous, okay, which is the worship of idols or excessive devotion to or reverence for some person or thing. You know what I hate to hear? I love sports. I love boxing. I love basketball. I love football. But you know what I hate people to say here? Why, why I hate to hear people say, oh, they're the GOAT. They're the greatest of all time. And nobody messing with them, bro, right? And we, we don't realize when we bragging and boasting about these people and saying that they're the greatest of all time, we just put them on a pedestal and we idolizing people. Idolatry, <laughs> all right? You want to know, know another way? American Idol. Look, it, it's, it's in the title, American Idol, right? People are idolizing these singers and these entertainers, right? We do this all the time and don't even realize we're doing what we're doing, okay? Um, an idol is anything that replaces the one true God. The most prevalent form of idolatry in the Bible times was the worship of images that were thought to embody the various pagan deities, okay? So again, we, we got to be careful with how we do what we do. But let's go back and look at that verse one more time. What does it say? Verse seven and eight, the one who conquers will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderous, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sorrowful, which is the second death. And what's crazy is all of us fit into those categories. We One of those things calls our names, okay? And of course, the last one on the list was liars. It says all liars, a person who tells lies. And we know about Pinocchio with that long nose, right? 
right? Technically, that would disqualify us. <clears throat> but look, the new heaven and the new earth is a place for people who have overcome sin. The Lord wants us to always have victory over sin, right? And with his spirit, we can do it. You can say no to any sin that comes your way. You don't have to do it. The thing that's crazy is once you begin to enter into that world of sin, what happens is you become a slave to it and you don't realize it. That's why when there are certain habits that we need to stop, I can't live without this. I got to have it. I got to do it. I'm sorry. You are a slave to it. That's why you can't let it go. It's got your mind. It's holding you hostage, right? But again, the new heaven and the new earth is a place for people who have overcome sin. Look at what God tells Cain in Genesis chapter four. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? I mean, he's pouting like a little kid, right? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it, okay? Or in the King James Version, it says overcome it, okay? So again, there's a choice. And God is making it plain that he wants you to forsake sin so that you can have a place with him, right? But many people don't choose Jesus as Lord and Savior because they're unwilling to forsake sin their sin. There's something about it that grabs them and holds them hostage and they don't want to let it go. Right? But then look at this. Again, I know we've all fallen into those categories, but look at what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. He says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people idolatrous, adulterous, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. But check this part. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So now y'all could be like, oh, I, I can be saved. Yeah, you can be saved. Anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. All you have to do is come to Christ, confess your sin, hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and ask Jesus to save you. Submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And at that moment, the Lord will save you just like that. Right? I've never seen any person who's ever come to Jesus and Jesus said, no, I won't save you. It's never happened, right? It's a great pleasure and joy for him to save men who genuinely want him as Lord and Savior, right? And that's what's incredible. So again, those people that won't inherit the kingdom of heaven, they won't inherit it, not because they can't, but because they're unwilling to let go of their sin, okay? So back to our main verses, Revelation 21 and 9. Remember, this writing is a vision that John has, but literally it's like God has taken him. It's like he's taken his spirit out of his body and allowed him to see something because he's walking, he's going through, he's seeing these things and interacting with what he is seeing. Okay. So Revelation 21 and 9, then one of the seven angels who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. So this is an angel that John saw previously in the revelation vision in some of the previous chapters before when he had bowls, some of the angels have bowls of wrath that they poured out upon the earth. Okay. But then one of the seven angels who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb. He then carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. 
Her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Okay. And so none of us have ever seen a clear crystal. We've seen crystals, we've seen gold, we've seen a lot of stuff, but clear, like you can totally see through the entire thing. You've never seen that before, right? But we will. And I'm not saying that we're just looking at a crystal. I'm saying it says her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone. Matter of fact, let's go back up. He then carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city. Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Now remember, God's glory is so incredible. We don't even need the sun anymore. The, the, the brilliance of it is takes the place of the sun because it's so bright, right? And that brightness, that brilliance will have the entire city illuminated. The city will be filled with this. So when you look at it, it's like, Oh my goodness, like you've never seen anything like it. Arrayed with God's glory, her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Okay, we're going to look at what a jasper stone looks like momentarily. In Revelation 21 and 12, the city had a massive high wall with 12 gates. 12 angels were at the gates. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates, okay? So this new city that will be our dwelling place, that is where God dwells right now, right? That particular city is going to have high walls and it's going to have 12 gates, okay? And there will be 12 angels at the gates, okay? And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. What a high honor to have, okay? And then the next verse, there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. So it's laid out like a square, the entire city with high walls, okay? And the walls are made of jasper, clear jasper, um, and there are 12 angels at the 12 gates and they all positioned all over the place. And on each door of the gate are inscribed the names of uh, <clears throat> the 12 sons from the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. Then it says the city wall had 12 foundations and the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the lamb were on the foundations. So you got the, the 12 sons of Jacob or Israel, right, that are on the doors. And then you have the 12 names. So this city has 12 foundations. A house has one foundation that it sits on. But this one has 12 foundations. And they all have the name of the uh, 12 disciples on them. Okay. Now check this out. Consider this. What you do in this life matters. The Lord Jesus Christ honored the sons of Jacob by having their names on the gates of the heavenly city. The 12 disciples' names were written on the 12 foundations of the city. Your name will be somewhere. Your reward can be somewhere and something great in the life and kingdom that is to come. God never forgets the things that we do for his glory. And in his name, honor God with your life so that you can always be remembered and that the gift that he gives will go with you for all of eternity. So we've looked at like the great white throne judgment, but there's also a judgment for us when we leave this place, when we go see Jesus face to face. Right. And the Bible doesn't specifically give us a, a time of how and where it's going, I mean, when it's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to be immediately when we arrive to be with the Lord in heaven once we pass from this life. We don't know exactly when it's going to be, but for sure we're going to have one. And what's going to happen is that judgment for us does not determine whether we go to heaven or not, right? He doesn't look at all of our sins like he does the one people at the great white throne judgment. Jesus judges our works, right? the things that we've done for him in his name. 
And he judges our works to see if it was really for him or was it for ourselves, right? And based on how we worked and what we've done for the Lord, right? And if we've really done it for him, if we've done it for ourselves, that's going to determine how great our reward is going to be, right? And so there's no competition when it comes to serving God, but you want to get as much as you can. You want to do all that you can for the Lord Jesus Christ so that your eternal reward will be great, will be fast, will be unreplaceable, right? This is what you want to do, but it means that you have to get off your backside and you got to serve God. You got to see where God wants you to be and how he wants you to live so that God can honor you on the other side, like he's honoring the 12 disciples and the sons of Jacob, right? That's important. Uh, many of us are going to get to heaven, and many of us are going to make it to the new Jerusalem, but we won't really have no reward, right? And, and you say, yeah, man, I just want to be with Jesus and have eternal life. That's cool, but Jesus is offering you more, right? And it, <laughs> why would you settle for less when he wants to offer you more? It, it's all on you what you want to do and how you want to do it, right? But it's a reason why the preacher pounds the, the pulpit on Sundays. It's a reason why we always encouraging you to get up and serve God because there's a reward in it and it pleases God, right? And this is what you want to do. This is just a small example. Man, look, I, we don't know how great the reward is going to be, right? This is just a small thing that they have going on. Ain't no telling what God will have for you. If you just serve them. Revelation 21 to 15. We almost done for the night. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its wall. Read that again. So you listen. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out in a square. It's a length. And width are the same. He measured the city with the rod at 12,000 stadia. I'll explain that. Its length, width, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to human measurements, which the angel used. Now, now what are we really looking at? Boom. All right. <clears throat> so, these are the measurements. The city, just the city. We ain't talking about the entire new world. We're just talking about the city where Jesus is going to live and where we'll be constantly back and forth. The city is 1,400 miles in height, width, and length, okay? And so if you get a map and you look at the map, right? And I should have put that on here. I didn't think about that. But if you look at a map of the United States, that is practically the width of the bottom of Texas, all the way to Canada, okay? One city. Now, between <laughs> Texas and Canada, you got a whole bunch of cities. Even if you go on a straight line, you run across a bunch of different cities, and none of them compare to the, <laughs> the length, the height, and the width of this one city that we'll be living in with Jesus Christ. That's incredible, yo. And that's not even all of the new earth and the new heaven. That's just the main city, right? So it's 1,400 miles in height, 1,400 miles wide and 1,400 miles in length. That is a huge city, right? And the walls, he measured the walls. The walls are 216 feet wide. That's the walls that'll be covering or in front of the city. This is a huge place, but it has to be because it's dealing with all of the saints from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the tribulation, and the millennial kingdom. You're talking about people from every era that has ever existed. That's incredible, okay? And this is where we're going to end and uh, because next week is a few more numbers and it's a lot of stuff that I want to show you and I can't do all of that in just one session. I have to break it up, okay? Um, Revelation 21 and 18, the building material of its wall was jasper and the city was pure gold, clear as glass, okay? So this is a picture of what jasper looks like, a jasper stone. But remember, it said that the Jasper stone was clear, like you could see through the Jasper stone. You can't see through that. We've never seen a material like that where you can actually see through it. OK, 
Okay. And so this would be incredible to see the whole, all of the walls, they look like that, but it's a city of gold. Uh, then there are gates that are made of pearl and, and you got 12 foundations that are made of something different. So the, the incredible length of the beauty is beyond what you can expect, man. It's, it's mind blowing. But again, and it's 80, it's 805. So good. That's perfect. Still an album. Um, as we continue to explore more about the new earth and the new heaven and looking at the spectacle of what to expect, it, it's incredible to really think about it. And again, it's one of those things that your mind has a limited grasp on. You can only take so much when you look at it, but it's, it's man, <laughs> that's all I can say. It makes you excited to see what's coming next. Um, it makes you excited and wonder, like, land lower, how much longer before you actually come through so we can actually see this and not just talk about it and look at it, but, you know, experience it and live it forever. That day is coming. Until then, Christ has called us to be faithful and he's given us time so that we can serve him to enjoy it more with the rewards that he'll relinquish to us. All right. That is our lesson for today. <clears throat> Questions, comments, thoughts. Anything. Criticism. I'm listening. Okay. <clears throat> that sounds like nothing. <laughs> Any prayer requests for tonight? No prayer requests? Okay, is anybody still there? Am I talking to myself? Can y'all hear me? Hello? Uh, I pray for uh, tomorrow for our, our, our interview for tomorrow. Okay, got you, something. got you. Okay, for the grant. Okay. Yeah. The, the grant and just for our interview that we're doing, our film. Got you. Hmm? Project. Bam. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. We are extra quiet tonight. I don't know. Was it a test? Did y'all get mad at me because of the test or what? What's going on? All right. If there's nothing else, let's pray it up and we'll jump back into this thing next week. Father God, we thank you for the day and we thank you for, uh, again, Lord, highlighting and showing uh, the things that are to come, Master. Uh, we thank you for the fact that you have not forgotten us. And not only have you not forgotten us, Lord, but you are looking to spoil us in the future in a way like none other. Uh, thank you for making the way through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Uh, thank you for allowing us to be able to choose you, Master, just like you have chosen us from the beginning of time. Thank you for the book of life in which our names are inscribed in, Lord. I pray, Father, that tonight's lesson has put a fire under us to want to go and serve you, Lord. Lord, for the fact that you have put our sins to the side, Lord, to remember them no more. And we can have a continual place with you in your kingdom, Master. We love you, Lord. Lord, I know that there are things that are on our hearts and on our minds that we may not have expressed, Lord. And I pray that your Holy Spirit makes intercession pertaining to those things. So as we continue to go through our day-to-day -day life, we can have peace knowing that you have covered us, Lord. Master, we come to you, Lord, and we want to put the request of Ashley on the altar, Lord. She has a project that she has been putting her heart and her soul into, Master, and we want to see it come into fruition, Lord. We pray that everything that we need, Father God, whether it comes to equipment or people or access to anything, Father God, or finances, we pray that you make that available, Lord, and we pray that we just continue to be patient uh, with you until you make those things available, knowing, Lord, that your timing is better than anything that we could try to push or make happen on our own. And Father God, we want to lift up uh, Douglas Turner, Father God, as well as he is in the hospital, Lord, praying for a speedy recovery, praying that you give him strength, Father God, and allow him to be able to just continue to bounce back and serve you uh, in ministry, Lord, as you have allowed him to do for so many years. Lord Jesus, we just love you and we thank you. We pray that you continue to carry us on throughout the week, Lord. And we pray that we can be at somebody's church on Sunday, Father, uh, giving you glory and praising your holy and righteous name. We just love you and we thank you. These are our blessings we ask of you in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope that it is. All right, good people. 
Oh, wait. Everybody can go except Kiwi. You, you got a test you got to take. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll stop share. Hey, man, look, y'all be blessed. If y'all got questions, of course, y'all know my number. How living when you get the opportunity? Good Peace. night. Night.